to equal educational opportunities and facilities and with full realization. That's right. Basic education in the 1970s is supposed to be free but compulsory. It was neither free nor was it compulsory for the years that we have been having this constitution. So I only hope that we will not have this again in this draft when it becomes a constitution, only to be like the 1997 constitution. It is here because it is meant to help develop. It is meant to serve the people. But if it is not applied, then it will, it will not serve the purpose for which it is drafted here. So that's my problem. This is in the 1997 constitution, but it was never applied. <laughs> because education has never been free here. No one will convince me that we have had basic education free here. I've been paying school fees for people in basic education. So nobody can convince me that it was free. It has never been free. But the law is set. I wasted in 1997, 2000, 1997. And what the minister answered was, we don't have the means. I said, but what, what are you doing? We don't have the means. And the law is saying that it is mandatory for children of this country at that level to have education free, but compulsory. So there is no question that the resources are supposed to be there. They are there. That's why the law is saying that it should be free. And that's why the other ones are not compulsory. They are not free. Progressively, we are moving towards making them free, but they are not free. But the basic education should be free. And here also it is dedicated. So, the, the, the problem is, it is not enough for us to make laws, but we must have the mechanism of implementing those laws to make them meaningful. If you don't do that, they are useless. So that's the problem here with this uh, uh, Clause 57, which is a, almost a repeat of 1997 Constitution section on this. Now. Let me put nine. Close foot nine, freedom of religion and conscience. Now, foot nine, three. To me, is the, the, the formulation is weak, and it is not supposed to be weak, because what it's saying is, for 93, is a person may, the word may is what I'm underlining, a person may be denied access to any institution A person may not be denied access to any institution, employment, or facility, or enjoyment of any right because of the person's belief or religion. The word may should be replaced with shall. For me, that's, this is fundamental. Honorable, uh, uh, that's why I appear to uh, <coughs> tend to have an issue. I, I am not agreeing or disagreeing with your suggestion, but I am saying that it appears as if that is going into the details. Don't you think that the, to change that word from me to shall should wait for the, if we get to the consideration stage? Yes, that's my point. Thank you. Seven E, seven one E. He saying, tertiary and higher education shall be made equally accessible to all on the basis of capacity by no, it, yeah, basis of capacity by every appropriate means and in particular by the progressive introduced, like I was saying. But what is of concern to me here is D, close 
57 D, 1 D, 2 D rather. He said, functional literacy shall be encouraged and intensified as far as possible, and the development of a system of schools with adequate facilities at all levels shall actively, you know, like, <coughs> the same shall be encouraged. This should be undertaken by government as a matter of necessity. Functional literacy. It's not, it should not be left like it is here. It should be undertaken seriously because <laughs> very soon, if you, if you mean business, very soon we'll be doing, dealing with only with our languages. English will just become functional when we are dealing with the outside world. But internally, we'll be dealing, when we are dealing among ourselves with matters, we use our own language. Which means that functionality is, is, is an absolute necessity. The surprising thing is before, in the 80s, in the 70s and 80s, it was very strong in this country. But it has died out. I don't know any institution which is now running functional literacy classes in this country. And the constitution is making this very important. So it is not a matter of encourage, but the government should undertake to promote functional literacy among the people of this country. That is the only way we are moving towards development and liberating the minds of the people and our own minds. This National Assembly itself needs to be re-educated <coughs> for that matter. Particularly when we talk about cultural rights, <laughs> there is no, the fundamental thing in culture is language. If you miss language, then you miss everything else. So when you talk about cultural rights, number, language is number one. And that is why since 1953, UNESCO made it an absolute necessity for every child in the world to have the first stages of education in the mother tongue. Since 1953. And we are still here that we are sitting with all these problems that we have. Unless we stop adversating this language issue is fundamental to our development, is fundamental to our identity. So we must take it up seriously. Otherwise, we will not go anywhere. And that's why we have been grouping in the uh, dark for the last 55 years. We are, no, we are just turning around. Because we have not been free culturally. I know the, 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 <coughs> the Environment Committee will be very interested in this clause and maybe they will say a lot of things about it because if you talk about the right to a clean environment, currently any from here, Banjo, the capital, move to Serekunda, how is the environment like? Polluted? Rotting, no cleaning up. People have to dip into their pockets to pay for people to come and collect their refuse. So the whole place is dirty. When it rains, every place is smelly. So what is the role of the councils? What are the councils doing about the cleaning up of their environment? Let's go to have this provision. But then I say again, implementation. How do we ensure that these things are implemented to serve the people? That's the issue. We have them beautifully written, but they never see the light of day. I think the, 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 the important thing is to ensure that this happens. And the same thing goes for Well, some of these things will be dealt with when we come to. But let me come to something which is very, I've been thinking about since day one. <coughs> the nomenclature that they have chosen for the IEC. 
Independent Electoral Commission <coughs> is called here Independent Boundaries and Electoral Commission. I'm not comfortable with it. It does not say exactly what we want. First, there are no independent boundaries in this country, and the emphasis of independence seems to be placed on boundaries. And the emphasis of independence should be placed on IEC. Independent Electoral Commission is what is important. I think the best way to do this is to call IEC Independent Electoral Commission and make bound constituency boundaries demarcation each one of its supreme functions on the IEC and let us, let us remove it from the name because it is, it, in fact it is not named there because independent boundaries it means nothing. We don't have independent boundaries so why do we have independent boundaries? They either have to have, say constituency boundaries but independent boundaries don't exist. So why do we have it in the name? I would propose that we have independent electoral commission and the vacation of constituency boundaries be one of its supreme functions. We put it under it as a function, not to be added to the name, because it is confusing. And to, to finally, qualifications for the president close 93F yes it is stated here Clause 93, that one of the, the qualifications that the person concerned holds a minimum of an undergraduate degree to a five years work experience. I agree 100% with that. But the next one is what I am questioning. Holds a minimum of junior secondary school certificate or its equivalent plus I don't know, 12 years, works in the end after. You see, as long as we continue to, to take English as our official language, as long as we continue to use it in matters of officialdom, then it is absolutely necessary that the head of state of this republic is highly qualified in the use of that instrument. If not, we have a problem. I have seen it in the old parliament and in this one. Even where they are briefed, it is difficult for some people to grasp the essence of what is being debated or what is, being, what is to be said. So the mastery of language is fundamental. We are in this country. Some of us have been teachers, oh, no, oh, many of us here have been teachers. You know that currently the situation in the Gambia, even grade 12, somebody who can speak fluently English, grade 12, and can write fluently, it's difficult to come back. And there are many just, Johnny just comes in our politics. Johnny just comes who would want to be president, just like that. And they have the possibility to become president. Because people don't look at qualifications. And if a journey just come, becomes a president who does not know how to speak English, then we have a problem. When he goes to the United Nations, are you going to stand behind him and be speaking for him? No, or oh, her? Huh? Are you going to drag his speech or her speech on the spot in the United Nations Hall? Impossible. So you must have the capacity. And that is why I agree with the first one, F. But G, I question. I think we should have much more than that. 
a president of this country should have much more than just a great wealth. It is an insult to a republic. That happens in situations which are, and we are not in that situation. I can give you situations where the presidents are not necessarily graduate, but they are fantastically intellectual. But they have, they have moved themselves. They have developed themselves. They came from certain experiences, and because they knew they were going to assume such functions, they prepared themselves. We don't have that in this country. So, I, for one, I will not go for G. F, fine. But I don't like interrupting or disrupting your interventions, but again, these are valid points for consideration. I'm raising them, but we'll come with you, madam. <laughs> You've given me the, the outlines, the very details, very good. But well, the details, I think, for, uh, for <coughs> sorry, I'm consideration sorry. state. You, you have been it. consistently stealing my time. So I'm going to add more time. <laughs> huh? Okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Because why is he saying one? One fifty-seven one. Hmm. Interrupting because for me, once I get interrupted, I tend to lose my trend of thinking. But. I just had to. So you are deliberately I'm sorry. doing that to, to mix up my thoughts. <laughs> ah, this is not. This is not old. Old. <laughs> Okay, he said the business of the clause nine one ninety seven one fifty seven one. The business of the national assembly shall be conducted in in, in the English language or in any other language indigenous to the Gambia. So, you see how important our languages have become. And that is why it is fundamentally important. What I was saying about, you say, encourage. No, it is an obligation now for government to assume that responsibility. Because these languages, and then this constitution has not gone to its logical conclusions on this particular provision. Because there are two forms of literacy in this country currently, madam. There are people who are literate in an alien language, which is English. And there are people who are literate in their own languages. And this constitution now say that, that those languages can be used here. The logical thing is that anybody who is literate in these languages is also entitled to eligible to become a member of this national assembly that should be the logical thing anybody who is literate in a gambian language i know most of us here are not literate in gambian languages but we are here by virtue of being english speakers but the law is now saying if you want to speak your language you can speak it here and we all know, we already know that there are a lot of people in the country who are literate in the Gambian languages. They are citizens, they have a right to representation. So the constitution should have provided that anybody who is literate in a Gambian language is also eligible to become a member of this parliament. For me, madam, that should be the logical conclusion on this on this particular provision here. Anybody literate in any Gambian language has a right to become a member of this National Assembly because he or she has a right to speak in a language of her choice here, which is Gambian. I think we must promote that. If you don't do that, we are not fair to the people of this country. I'll stop here for this time. In the rest, I'll deal with when we come to competition. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Honorable member for Yara Central. Yara Central, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for granting me the opportunity 
to also throw my light on the bill that we have before us this morning, <coughs> which is the draft constitution 2020 of the Republic of the Gambia. <coughs> Uh, I'm sorry, Honorable, before you proceed, uh, just allow me. I just want to get my records right. Did I get the Honorable Member for Sabiji? Was it Sabiji or Opa Fuladu? Who raised the time? <coughs> Are you okay, then I'm right. Thank you. You can proceed, yes. Uh, Honorable Speaker, as I was um, on my foot, first of all, I would um, commend the CRC, which is the Constitutional Review Commission, for inclusion of certain clauses which has never been in the 1997 constitution which ranges from the presidential term limit um, inclusion of the, um, any national language to be used in the national assembly in the gambian national assembly chambers um, so on and so forth Honorable Speaker, however, there are also issues that I definitely, when I saw them in the, in the, in the draft, in the 2020 draft constitution, um, I started thinking twice, Honorable Speaker. Um, the constitution of the, the draft constitution, Honorable Speaker, started with a clause most preferably um, clause 7.3, which reads, Honorable Speaker, if you might allow me the, uh, the opportunity, the validity or legality of this constitution is not subject to challenge by or before any court or other organs of state. <coughs> Honorable Speaker, when the CRC was going around the whole country, I could fully remember the words that they were saying is that anything we put in this draft 2020 constitution would be the view of the people, of the Gambian people, for that matter, not every, um, any person, but the view of the Gambian people. So, Honorable Speaker, if anything that this draft 2020 constitution contains is the view of the Gambian people, this clause that this constitution is starting with definitely is, um, is a thing that somebody should have to think of. If the Gambian people their opinion is what is being put in this draft. Yet, they do not have the mandate, even whereas they are innocent of certain clause or certain section when this bill is being passed. They have no mandate to challenge it in court. Honorable Speaker, it is something that we have to think of. Personally, I myself, I have to think of this very, very passionate. I'm looking for the clause that you referred to. Um, Can you help me, please? If you go to the draft, Honorable Speaker, the final draft, the <coughs> yeah, the bill. There's a section. Okay, the bill. Seven. Yes, seven. Yes, because I think you said section 10. No, I said seven. seven. I, I mean plus seven. Because it is not yet um, passed, so this is why I'm using the word plus. Seven, 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 seven. Seven, three. Have you seen it? How do we speak up? May I continue, Honorable Speaker? Yes. yes, thank you very much. <clears throat> um, it's a cause of alarm, Honorable Speaker, to me and
because if somebody has been um, confronted among my constituents and happens to be involved in any other issue where it has to involve court and he is innocent in so doing he will not have um, any legality to challenge this constitution so therefore honorable speaker it's a cause of alarm for me honorable speaker we have been trying to open a new chapter in democracy the gambia for that case <clears throat> in so doing honorable speaker the draft should not have started with a clause of this nature it is it is definitely um inconsistent with the rule of law This clause is inconsistent with the, code of, um, with, the, with the rule of law. And definitely, we, what we have to understand, Honorable Speaker, is that the Constitution is not equal to the Ten Commandments of God. <clears throat> the Constitution is not equal to the Ten Commandments of God, Honorable Speaker, because these things are made by human beings, and we all know that no human being is perfect. We can change it anytime we need, when the need arises. And we can add anything when the need arises. I'm just trying to buttress on that clause, Honorable Speaker of which this draft is starting with. So, I cannot take this to be the Ten Commandments of God. On that being the case, I think um, that clause, something needs to be done about that clause. <coughs> Honorable Speaker, when you go to the confirmation of judges, section, if you go to the confirmation of judges, honorable speaker, section 190, honorable speaker, the principles and the merits. Yes, the details. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Um, honorable speaker, confirmation of the judges of the highest court of the Gambia, I think, is. Um, in this constitution is, is subjected to the approval of the National Assembly. If we pass this, that's what will happen. So any judge of high court that we are going to um, hire, his issue will be brought to the National Assembly for confirmation. Honorable Speaker, my fear here is that The issue might be politicized. We have seen what has passed um, during the last session. So this issue also, or that clause also, Honorable Speaker, need to be looked at very, very, very carefully. Um, what a surprise was to me, Honorable Speaker, is that the CRC, in some instances, while drafting this constitution, the 2020 draft, would just go directly and cut from the Canaan constitution and paste. We are not, I'm not disputing, that, I'm not disputing the fact that they can go and make their research 
on various countries as how they work. But Honorable Speaker, cutting and pasting was not the reason why we instituted CRC in, in, in two years ago. We taught them to go around the whole country, ask the view of the people, get it on board, try to see how to incorporate them into a constitution. But Honorable Speaker, instead of that, the clause that I have just quoted for you where this constitution started with is just a cut and paste from the Kenyan constitution, 2010. They could have made some amendments. There's no problem. But cutting and pasting, and you call that the view of the people, of the Gambian people? Honorable Speaker, I say no. So many of these drafts here, many issues are here, are not view of the Gambian people. It's just a cut and paste from Kenyan Constitution, 2010. On that note, Honorable Speaker, I beg to beg, take my seat. Thank you very much, Honorable Member for Bundun Kakunda. Bundun Kakunda, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker, for giving me the floor. Honorable Speaker, it was uh, December 2017, we passed an act to enable the CRC to review the 1997 Constitution. And early 2018, the President assent to the act. And June 2018, the members of the CRC were appointed. And it was on the 15th of November 2019, CRC prepared a draft new constitution. And it is brought to us back. We gave them the mandate, and we are here today to speak or to debate on the merits and the general principle of that draft constitution. Therefore, Honorable Speaker, this is a crucial moment in our role as a National Assembly members because we are in a transition and a lot of things has happened in the past which we are not proud of and it is only when we come up with good laws we can redress some of those issues. So, this is a very historic day for us and we are here not representing our people, uh, ourselves only, but representing our people who voted for us to come here and represent them. And the mandate given to CRC was to go around and engage every Gambian at every corner, even outside the Gambia, to engage them and incorporate their takes on this new constitution. And we believe the CRC has done a tremendous job by going all over the country, 
the land and bread, meeting all categories of people to sound their opinion how they want to be governed. Honorable Speaker, this draft constitution before us today is one of the most important documents for our democratization. It is important because in any transition of a good democracy, it requires a social contract between the governing and the governed. This was the mandate that was given to them. Therefore, Honorable Speaker, at this juncture, when we said we want a new Gambia, we had two options. One was to amend the, the Dragonian laws that were bad, very bad, that were in the constitution, or two, to revoke the existing one, that is the existing constitution, which we went for. And now the draft constitution is in front of us here today. We all know that making a, good, uh, a new constitution is very difficult and complex. This is why I want to thank CRC for their tremendous job that they do to make sure that they went through numerous processes and make consultation. to make sure that they have agreed to a common laws that different Gambians give their opinions to make sure that everybody's opinion or the majority's opinion is put on board. A double speaker, we really want to break from the past. So I think this draft constitution is the best document to lead us into our new democratization we want. After reconciliation, we need this draft to address social redress. We might have issues about this constitution, but we should realize that there is no one constitution that can favor everybody at a time. What is important is to look at it critically and see ourselves both in and out to so make sure that it will be good for our people, that is the citizens of this nation. It is not for ourselves, but it's for every Gambian. We all know a lot of money is invested in it, a lot of efforts. 
and it has been sanctioned by us, then definitely we should try and make sure that we give our blessing to the views or how Gambians want to be governed. Honorable Speaker, I always advocate for the autonomy of this parliament since at the inception or since we came here. I have my reasons. In order for us to perform our oversight function properly and the way it should be, I think the National Assembly should be autonomous. Since we came, we tried a lot, but some of our efforts were hindered simply because we are not autonomous. And this draft constitution has come to make this National Assembly to be autonomous so that it can perform its oversight function as the way it should be. Most of the time, the whole country rely, rely on this National Assembly when all hopes are lost. But sometimes what normally happens is we are not able to perform up to expectations because we will be told that we need to um, have confirmation from the executive to be able to do certain things. And therefore, Honorable Speaker, this um, draft constitution has highlighted a lot of issues that will help us to break away from the past, which we all know that we are not happy about both those who are in and those who are out. And since we are all here now, we have a decision to make and we have a history to make. We can either be either in the good side of the history or the bad side of the history. So it will be important if we consider what or how our people want to be governed. And I believe there are a lot of things in this draft constitution that are very good to help us break away from the past and bring a lot of rules or laws that will help us to have a very good Gambia. Honorable Speaker, the Constitution or the draft Constitution highlights the devolution and the decentralization of the local government. Um, in the past, we have a lot of institutions, good institutions, but there were no enough laws to be able to help them to perform up to expectation, to perform as how they should. But we could see that this constitution has really come to help the institutions to function as they are expected.
to give them necessary powers in order for them to operate as they are expected to do. And Honorable Speaker, in Africa, our problem is leadership. Many, many years, we trust our leaders, but they end up failing us. And this constitution, one thing I like about it, most of the bone of contention, it has come to clarify or remove all ambiguity that will bring commotion or that will bring ambiguity that may bring problems for us. For instance, that is the, the two time limit and how does it start? Honorable Speaker, with all fairness, I think if we, are, if, if we want to advocate for two terms, I think the best thing is for us to start with a good example. I'm surprised to hear some of my colleagues to think that, or to say that, the incumbent who is in the office before the Constitution will come into law, the, the term that he served before the Constitution should not be counted. Yes, it could not be. That is obvious. But if that is what we are advocating for, I mean, I think it, it is in fact better for that person to start with a good example so that we know that we really mean what we are saying. But often a time in Africa, this is how it will start at the beginning, if we are not very much attentive. Some will say, we are here for three months. They go for three or uh, two months. And while they are going, they want to remain in power forever. I think rules are what should help us to redress all those problems and to be a good example or if we are to mean what we are saying I think we should start initially or whoever start but most often a time those incumbents who started that, who will start that, we will see as we are going, they will start to think about, in fact, not second term, but third term, fourth term. I mean, Africa should break away from that right now. And African leaders are the wishes and the expression of Gambians who we represent here. The CRC doesn't make this constitution by their own. They contacted our people. And a lot of resources is put to it.